Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. Noble to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the privilege, the opportunity that we have this morning of studying your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we study it this morning, that you would indeed help us to understand, uh, help us to apply. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would wash us with the water of your word. Cleanse us, sanctify us, transform us, cause us to become more and more like Christ. Increase our faith in you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Back several years ago when I was a youth pastor down in Waukesha, I had the opportunity to lead a missions trip one year down to Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, we were working on the Cherokee Indian Reservation down there. Uh, and in the middle of the trip, we had a break day. We had an opportunity to go tubing on one of the rivers that runs through the reservation. Uh, we were out tubing on that river and we came across a waterfall. A waterfall that looked like it was the type of waterfall you could actually climb. It was about 40 feet tall. It was not terribly steep. There was a fair amount of water coming down it, but it looked like it was climbable. And since I was a young, ambitious youth pastor and I had two high school uh, boys with me, we decided that we were going to tackle this waterfall. We were going to climb it. Uh, one of the uh, high school students wimped out a little bit and chose an easy route. He decided to go around the waterfall and go up the side. But the other high school student and I, we decided to go right up the middle, right through the water to the top. I was fairly confident that we were going to make it to the top. Uh, I was fairly confident that we were going to tackle that waterfall. I was young, I was strong, I was bold, I felt courageous. And then about 20 feet up the waterfall, the unthinkable happened. I slipped. And I didn't just slip, I slipped and I fell backwards. It was the moment of my defeat. I had started out so strong and courageous, I had started out bold, I had been successful, prosperous, and now I was absolutely defeated. And I knew that awaited me at the bottom was either pain or death. You know, oftentimes that's how life seems to go. We seem to be doing so well. We seem to be prospering. We seem to be successful. We're, we're experiencing success with parenting our kids. They're obeying. They're doing what we want them to do. We're having success with our churches. Everything seems to be wonderful. Things are going great in our careers. We feel strong. We feel competent. And then out of nowhere, we have defeat. And suddenly our efforts are revealed for what they are, weak, feeble, frail. And all of a sudden we're left realizing that we are not the parents that we thought we were. We're left realizing that our church is not the model church. We suddenly realize that despite what our coffee mug may say, we are not the world's greatest employee. And all of a sudden we feel defeated. In that moment of failure, we just feel Weak. We feel anything but strong and courageous. We feel anything but prosperous and successful. And then we come to this passage here in Joshua where God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. In fact, he tells him three times, be strong and courageous. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 9. We often think of that word strong as having to do with a, with a physical strength, uh, like the strength of our muscles. But it has more to do with being steadfast, with being immovable, with being steady. And that word courageous that goes along with it uh, often means the same thing, that idea of being immovable, of being steadfast. 
So in these verses, God is telling Joshua, Joshua, I want you to be steadfast. I want you to be dependable. I want you to be resilient. I want you to be strong and courageous. Be bold in this calling that I have given you to lead the people into the promised land. Be resolute. Be bold in following the law. Be bold. Be resolute because I am with you. And to top it all off, at the end of verse 8, God tells Joshua that if he's strong and courageous, if he is determined and resolute and immovable, he will be prosperous. He will be successful. We don't necessarily disagree with what God says to Joshua. It makes perfect sense. But there is a part of us that looks at this and says, how can God promise this to Joshua? And think that Joshua is actually going to do what it is that God is commanding him. How can Joshua be strong and courageous? Because so many times we're filled with failure. We're weak. We're anything but strong and courageous. And we begin to wonder as we look at this text, you know, perhaps Joshua is just on a higher, a higher spiritual plane than us. And that's why God can expect him to be strong and courageous. Maybe there's something special about Joshua. I mean, after all, he was Moses' disciple. Maybe Joshua is just better than us. And so as we look at this passage, instead we're filled with more failure. We're filled with more reminders of weakness. Because as we look at this text, we think, well, that's great for Joshua. But for the rest of us who are just mere humans, we are utterly defeated. We try to be strong and courageous. We try to be successful. And yet all we meet with is failure. So how are we supposed to look at this text? How are we supposed to be encouraged by this text? Well, the good news is that the truth of this passage is that Joshua's success did not lie in himself. Joshua was not somehow on a higher plane, a higher spiritual plane than the rest of us. Because left to himself, Joshua also would be defeated. And we see him defeated several times. He's defeated at Ai after the fiasco at Jericho. We see him make a fake treaty with the Gibeonites because he doesn't consult God first. Joshua also was human. Joshua also was prone to failure. But God can command Joshua to be strong and courageous despite Joshua's failings on his own and successful. And yet God is not writing Joshua a blank check. He's not saying, you just go do whatever you want and I'll bless it and I'll make you successful. No, it Specifically, God tells Joshua that there are three areas where he is going to make him strong and courageous. Three areas where he's going to make him prosperous and successful. And the great news about this passage as we're looking at it this morning is that those same promises that God makes to Joshua, he makes to us as well. That God is also going to make us prosperous and successful. He is also going to make us strong and courageous. Not because of our own efforts. Because our own efforts end up like I did on that waterfall. Instead, this passage is challenging us, like Joshua, to be strong and courageous in our trust in God, who makes us prosperous in three areas. He makes us prosperous in our calling. He makes us prosperous and strong through God's means. And He makes us prosperous and successful in His presence. His calling, His means, and His presence. Well, let's look first at that first qualifier there where God tells Joshua, Joshua, be strong and courageous, be confident. Joshua, be strong and have success, prosperity. Uh, Joshua was Moses' assistant. And specifically in Numbers 27 and Deuteronomy 31, Joshua is commissioned by Moses. Since Moses is going to die and not go over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, Joshua is commissioned and is told, you will be the one who will lead the people into the Promised Land. And we read here in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, Moses is dead. So now everything that has been put in place before, the calling, the commission, everything that Joshua has been trained to do, now it is going to take place. Now Joshua is going to do it. And at the same time, Joshua knew that the success in that calling lay specifically in God. Because God had also promised, not just that Joshua was going to be the instrument of God's leading the people into the promised land, but God had also told the Israelites that he was the one that would drive out the enemies of Israel. He had promised time and time again, Exodus chapter 33, I will send my angel before you, he says, to drive out the Canaanites. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, I'm actually going to send swarms of hornets that are going to drive out uh, the people who live there. Joshua's not going to be fighting in his own power. He's going to be fighting in dependence upon the angel of the Lord, fighting in dependence upon the strength of God to drive out these enemies. 
course, that doesn't mean that Joshua has an easy task. It's not as though he's just simply going to walk into the promised land. There'd be no reason whatsoever to tell Joshua to be strong and courageous if it was going to be easy. He's told to be strong and courageous because there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be things that are going to stand in his way. It's precisely because of those obstacles that Joshua has to be told, be strong and courageous. Israel is going to suffer defeats occasionally at the hands of those from Ai, a city that is so small that Joshua doesn't even send the entire army, and yet they're going to be defeated. Joshua may have assumed that they're going to win every battle, that they're never going to lose any soldiers, that everybody that is currently with him is going to be led into the promised land, and yet Achan and his family would never make it to the promised land, and neither would many who would give up on the way and lose faith, who would ignore Joshua, ignore God, would turn their back on him, and fall away, those people would not make it into the promised land. I think there were times that Joshua was probably tempted to throw in the towel, to quit and to give up. We read the same many times of Moses. God, how could you leave me with all these people? I think Joshua at many times felt the same way. This people, surely there's got to be a more obedient people somewhere that I can lead into the promised land. But you gave me these people? I'm sure there were times that Joshua wanted to quit. And yet God said, no, I'm going to give you success in that calling. This is what you have been called to, and this is what I'm going to help you do. Others may fall away. Others may turn back. But Joshua, you need to remain strong and courageous. You need to remain resolute. You need to confidently trust that I, the Lord, am going to help you achieve this calling. I think too often one of the problems when we come across thing that's ever going to happen that's going to make us doubt our calling. It's just going to be easy sailing. And when the opposite happens, we're suddenly shocked because we had the wrong idea of what it is that God was calling us to. We thought that God was going to call us to get every promotion, that God was going to call us to have the world's greatest boss, that God was going to call us to have perfect children who never do anything wrong ever. And yet God says, that's not what I've called you to. I've called you to raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I've called you to love them even when they disobey. I've called you to disciple them, to discipline them. God has called us to be workers that reflects our God, even in the midst of those awful circumstances. When we're persecuted for our faith, when others are telling us to cut corners, God says, no, I've called you to be faithful, faithful and obedient. We may even think that we're not successful as a church, unless we have lots of members, unless every pew and every seat is filled, and yet we need to realize that that's not necessarily what God has called us to. God has called us to be faithful as churches, to proclaim the gospel. Faithful to reach those who He has called us to reach, to carry out our mission as a church, regardless of attendance, regardless of the size of our budget, to faithfully proclaim whether there be two or three gathered in His name, or whether there be two or three thousand gathered in His name. Our calling as a church is to proclaim the gospel. Joshua's calling is to lead the people into the promised land, not to become filthy rich and conquer the entire world. We need to realize as we are examining this idea of being prosperous and successful, of being strong and courageous, that we are strong and courageous, we are prosperous and successful, specifically in that area where God has called us, which may not necessarily be what we want to accomplish but what He has called us to accomplish. And yet maybe you're sitting here this morning and you feel like a failure, not because of something that your kids did, not because of something that your boss did, but because of something you did. You realize that your failure as a parent is not because your kids didn't listen to you, but because you failed. You failed as a parent. You lost your temper. You said things that you shouldn't have said. You were unfair. You realize as you look at your work situation that the reason that your boss is upset at you is that you're not a very good worker. And you realize that it has nothing to do with your boss. It actually has to do with you. You know that God has called you to live a holy life, and yet all you see is failure. The sad truth is you feel like a spiritual failure because you are. We are all spiritual failures. All of us fail. All of us sin against our God in thought and word and deed. And yet the promise that God made to Joshua in terms of his calling is true of our calling to holiness as well. That the God who calls you to holiness is the God who actually gives you success in that calling. 
The God who called Joshua promised Joshua success because God himself would go before him and drive out those nations. And in the same way, God sent before us the person of Jesus Christ, who came thousands of years ago, long before us, and who lived a perfect life, and who died a perfect death on the cross, who did everything that the Father asked him to do, accomplished everything that the Father called him to, And it's because of Christ's success on our behalf that we are counted holy. It's because of Christ's success that we're forgiven as we place our faith in that perfect sacrifice. And yet it's also because of Christ's success that we are made successful. Because the God who calls you to holiness has already made you holy in Christ Jesus. And yet is also making you holy is at work in you right now, is sanctifying you and conforming you to the image of His Son. We are failures left to ourselves. And yet God is the one who makes us victorious over sin. It's the promise that Paul makes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For He who calls you is faithful, and He will surely do it. The God who calls us to be parents, to be workers, to be witnesses, to be holy, is the God who gives us success in that calling, who makes us successful in that calling, because He's the one that's at work in us. He is the one who is working through us, not just because of what we do, but because of what He has done, what He is doing and what He will continue to do. He is making and molding us into faithful parents. He is making and molding us and sanctifying us and causing us to be godly workers. He's even sanctifying us as churches and causing us to be gospel-proclaiming churches. That's the confidence that we have as we're called to be strong and courageous, that even when we fail, it doesn't change our calling. It's not as though God suddenly gives up on us and says, you know, I can't believe you did that. I rescind my calling. Now, Paul says in Romans, the calling of God is irrevocable. God has called us, and God is the one who is causing us to accomplish that calling. And as we consider that, as we consider who we are in Christ, something that will never change, we are confident in the calling that God has given us, but even more so confident that God is working through us to accomplish that calling. We recognize our calling to be godly. We recognize our calling to be holy. And we are confident that the God who has called us to that calling is the God who is working in us to accomplish that calling. And yet, not only could Joshua be strong and courageous, as can we in that calling, the God who has called us is the God who is working in us. us. Joshua is also reminded that he is to be confident. He is to be strong and courageous in God's means. God's appointed means. Look at verse 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. Joshua was told that he would have good success if he followed the law. It's important to note, though, God is not implying to Joshua, Joshua, you have to earn success here. You have to follow my law, and then I will make you prosperous and successful. In fact, God told Moses and the Israelites earlier, back in Deuteronomy chapter 9, do not say in your heart that the Lord your God has thrust out these other nations before you because of your righteousness. But it's actually because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. God has already said that Joshua's success was not going to be given because he deserved it. Not going to be given because he earned it. Not going to be given because somehow he he achieved it through following of the law. And yet at the same time, God is not calling Joshua to a task, promising success and then saying, Joshua, you just figure out the details of how you're going to do this. Now God's very specific. You're going to do this my way. God gave Joshua specific instructions as to how he was to take the promised land. And they may not have always made sense to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 5, just before their very first battle, Joshua pauses in the midst of enemy territory and circumcises the entire army. 
basically incapacitates his army so that they're unable to fight for a period of time. It makes absolutely no sense from a military perspective. And yet it makes perfect sense when you understand the sign of the covenant, the sign of the covenant that they are in the process of fulfilling, the covenant with Abraham that they are, they are inheriting the land that God promised. It makes sense for them to pause and to say, look, before we do this, we're going to do this God's way. We're going to make sure that we have followed the law. Again, not by man's wisdom, but by God's wisdom. So Joshua here is being careful to do everything written in the law. Especially remember the fact that the last group of Israelites that came to this exact point 40 years earlier did not follow God's law, did not obey God, did not trust God, and they ended up dying in the wilderness. And God is perfectly capable of sending them around for another lap if this generation won't follow God either. And yet God says, I want you to obey my law. Meditate on it day and night, he says. Uh, that word for meditate literally means to mumble, uh, which is why it says, do not let it depart from your mouth. Our, our sort of uh, mental meditation that we do on Scripture is somewhat foreign to Old Testament Israelites. They would actually mumble the word of God as they were meditating upon it. Joshua was to audibly meditate on the Word of God by reading it to himself constantly so that he would not turn aside to the right or the left, so that he'd be careful to do all that was written in it because he was reading it constantly. He knew what was in it, and he was able to follow it. You know, there are other means that would have made a whole lot more sense in some ways in order to achieve this taking of the promised land. The whole idea of walking around the city of Jericho for seven days doesn't make a whole lot of sense Especially when you figure that the city of Jericho was roughly the size of New Hope's property here, and Israel had half a million in their army. You have this small city, yes, surrounded by walls, but it wouldn't have taken a military genius to figure out how to get a half a million men to conquer a city that size. It certainly could have been done, done very easily, in fact. And yet God says, no, I want you to do it my way. Do it my way. And by doing it God's way, Nobody died. There probably would have been casualties the other way. Even today, we are called to accomplish God's calling, God's way. You know, God has called us as a body. God has called us as a church to worship Him, to be faithful, to proclaim the gospel. And He has said, you leave the growth up to me. You be faithful in your calling. You know, as I've reflected on New Hope over the years, I've come to the conclusion that there is a very simple way to grow New Hope Presbyterian Church to be the largest church in Green Bay. All you have to do is do the exact same thing that that really big church downtown on Lombardi Avenue does on every Sunday. You know, the one that's green and gold has a giant G on the side where 60,000 faithful worshipers gather every morning to worship their gods. I know some of you think I'm being a little over the top here, but the last time I went to a Packer game, Brett Favre ran onto the field to the music of O Sacred Head Now Wounded. I doubt that's what they knew the music went to, but again, it just simply uh, emphasized again the worship that goes on there. I guarantee that if New Hope wants to raise its attendance, it's very simple. All you have to do is offer free beer in the Packers, and there will be thousands of people packing this sanctuary and yet the gospel, not the Green Bay Packers, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We do things God's way, God's means. In the same way, anyone will tell you that you can be successful in business by cutting corners or, or just cheating a little bit here and there. I'm sure you've heard the advertisements on the radio about the instruction manual that guarantees perfect behavior for your kids. And yet, at the same time, it overlooks the heart completely. It just gives good external behavior. We could get our friends to believe the gospel, I'm sure, if we would just eliminate uncomfortable ideas like sin and hell. There are churches that have done that. And yet, that is not what God has called us to. God has given us His means for accomplishing the calling that He has placed upon us, His will. And He's given it to us in the same place that He gave it to Joshua in this book of the law. He has given us His will. He has told us what exactly it is that He wants us to do and how He wants us to do it. Joshua only had a few books to work with. We have 66 to work with and the person of Christ. God has revealed to us His means of how He wants us to accomplish His calling. In Scripture, we learn that it's by the power of the Word of God. 
It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives are transformed, that churches grow. As God works through the proclamation of His Word, through the proclamation of the Gospel, it's through word and sacrament that God continues to sanctify and enable us to fulfill His calling. There are many people and there are many churches who have tried to accomplish the calling that God has given them by doing it their way. Sort of like trying to climb a waterfall, only to be met with total failure at the bottom. God says, no, Joshua, you're going to follow me. You're going to do it my way. You're going to use my means to accomplish your calling. Not your wisdom, my wisdom. And God says the same thing to us. I've given you a calling. Do it my way. And then finally, we read that God gave Joshua success through his presence. In verse 9, God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In verse 5, God told Joshua, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God did not give Joshua a task to accomplish. He did not appoint the means and then say, you know, I'll see you later. Come back and let me know when you're done. No, God says to Joshua, I'm going to be right here with you the whole time. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34 says that Joshua had a spirit of wisdom from the laying on of the hands of Moses, a veiled reference to the Holy Spirit there, the Spirit of God. Joshua had the empowering of the Holy Spirit to enable him to accomplish the task that he'd been given. He was not on his own. It was the power of God that was enabling him to accomplish this calling that he'd been given. It was the power of God who was with him. These verses here in Joshua chapter 1 are not some divine pep talk before Joshua himself goes out and conquers the promised land. Instead, they are the promise of God telling Joshua, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you do this. I am going to give you success because I'm with you. As I mentioned earlier, I thought I could be successful on that waterfall. I thought as I was climbing that I was going to make it to the top. I was strong, I was courageous, I was bold, and yet I fell. And as a result, I was headed the wrong way, going down onto some jagged rocks at the end. I had tried it my way, and I knew I was about to die, or I was going to be seriously hurt, one of the two. And yet, obviously, I didn't die because I'm standing here before you today. And I stand here before you today because I actually wasn't alone that day. I was with that other high school student. Uh, That other high school student who was a weightlifter, who was a martial arts uh, expert, who was far more strong and courageous and bold than I was, and I hit him about two feet after I fell. He was directly behind me. And it was like hitting a brick wall. He didn't move at all. That was the only damage that I had. And the two of us got up, and I did what a typical uh, high school youth pastor would do. I got up, and we still climbed up the waterfall. But this time I was confident. But I wasn't confident in myself, because now I knew if I fall, that high school student will catch me. That high school student's going to be far more successful than I am. I know that I'm a failure. I can't do it, but I know that that high school student can. That's what God is telling Joshua. God is telling Joshua, Joshua, you can't do it on your own. I've given you a call and I've given you my means, but you're not going to be able to accomplish this by your own strength. You're going to need to rely on me, and I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. The same promise that Christ has made to us as well. The same promise that Christ made to us as He promised His disciples and us that He would send His Holy Spirit, that He would never leave us or forsake us. In fact, we have the Holy Spirit in a more complete and full way after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ than even Joshua had in the Old Testament. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a more powerful way even than Joshua. And God has told us, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. Yes, you are. You are a failure. And yet God says, I'm going to pick you back up. I'm going to put you back on your feet. I'm going to enable you to continue to fulfill your calling despite your children's actions, despite your actions, despite your boss's actions, despite whatever obstacles you may come across. Despite whatever sin you come across in your life, God says, I am faithful, and I will forgive, and I will strengthen, and I will continue to sanctify you and make you holy. God says, I'm the one who makes you prosperous and successful. I'm the one. I'm the one who gives you success as a witness. Even when you're a bad witness through your actions, God says, I'm still the one who's faithful to call those who I have chosen to call. 
I'm still the one, says God, who gives you the grace and the mercy to continue as a worker when you have a horrible boss or bad work conditions. God says, I'm the one who gives you the confidence to continue as a church. When our churches are racked by scandal or division or dissent, this Lord's Supper as people who understand we are weak. It's why we're coming to be fed here by the Lord's beans of grace. We recognize how hungry we are. We recognize how desperately we need God's grace. We recognize that we are weak. We are not strong and courageous in ourselves. We need, we need God's grace. We need His presence. You know, there is a sense in which this Lord's Supper makes very little sense when you really stop and think about it. Eat this piece of bread, drink this cup, and you'll become strong and courageous. Eat this piece of bread and drink this cup, and you will become prosperous and successful in the Lord's calling. That's part of why we say that taking the Lord's Supper is taken in faith, because we are coming as weak people. We are coming in faith in God's means, saying, yes, maybe the means don't always make sense to us as human beings, and yet we understand that these are God's appointed means, where God has said, this is the means by which I make you prosperous and successful. We eat this bread, we drink this cup in faith, in faith that we're being fed by God, in faith that we're beginning the strength that we need, God's grace to sustain us as we continue to persevere through obstacles, both spiritual obstacles and physical earthly obstacles. God's grace to sanctify us and to continue to make us holy, to continue to make us more like Christ. God's grace to strengthen us and to enable us to fulfill that highest calling that He's given us, to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. We're being fed by God's grace, very much in the same way that we've just been fed by God's grace through the preaching and the reading of His Word. We have here in many ways the Word made visible as we're seeing what it is that God does for us by His grace. He, he feeds us. It's why as we have these symbols here on this table of the bread and the juice, the bread representing the body of Christ, the juice representing the blood of Christ, it's part of why we don't just sit here in our chairs and look at it and meditate upon the symbolism of it. Ourselves, those representations of Christ's body in blood, in faith, declaring how spiritually hungry we are and how much we need God to feed us by His grace as He feeds us not just with bread and with juice, but feeds us with Christ, feeds us spiritually with the body of Christ, feeds us spiritually with the blood of Christ, feeds us with God's grace, just as He does with His Word. In this sacrament, He is making us strong and courageous. This is the means that God has appointed, the means by which God feeds us. And yet, as we partake of this Lord's Supper, we're also being reminded of Christ's presence. We're being reminded that God has promised that He will be with us, never to leave us or forsake us. And specifically, as we're feeding upon this Lord's Supper, we're being fed by Christ's presence because we are eating spiritually the body and blood of Christ. We're spiritually communing with Christ. That's why we often call the Lord's Supper communion because we are spiritually communing with Christ, feeding on Christ, but also feeding with Christ, because He is with us. As we look forward to that day, that great marriage supper of the Lamb, when we will again feed in Christ's presence forever.